Hello and welcome to this special live event, which is part of our Stay Active Cambridge programme. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Giles Yeo. Giles is a programme leader at the MRC Metabolic Diseases Unit in Cambridge, and his current research focuses on the influence of genes on feeding behaviour and body weight. He is also a broadcaster and author, presenting science documentaries for the BBC's Horizon, and trust me, I'm a doctor programme. His first book, Gene Eating, The Story of Human Appetite, was published in December 2018, and in 2020, he was awarded an MBE for services to research, communication and engagement. Today, Giles will explore how we can break the cycle of pseudoscience and misinformation surrounding the world of dieting, and there'll be a Q&A opportunity at the end of the session. So you, if you have any questions for Giles, please put them in the comments section below. So I'll now hand over to Giles to tell us the truth about diets. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Now let's just, you know, we have to tackle this all the time. We have to fight the screen sharing um, business application window. Um, hold on, Chrome tab, my entire screen application window. Where's my live window? Hang on a second. This is not good. Just give it a second. There we go. Perfect. Hopefully um, you guys can see this, otherwise someone will leap on and actually tell me that it's not happening. So thank you so much for taking your time out of your um, of your day to come and actually listen to, li listen to me about this. So um, my name is Giles Yeo, and, um, and as Karen said, I'm a geneticist here at the University of Cambridge, where I study the biological variation, the genetics of body weight, of which obesity sits on one end of the spectrum. And, and that's why I do my day job, that's what I teach. Um, but I just realized, and we within the field of, of, um, of obesity and diet-related illnesses, you know, realized that the only way that while the biological variation of how people respond um, um, and, and eat and behave um, is critically important to, to, to actually understand, we are never, ever going to fully fix the problem unless we fix this food environment that we currently live in. Okay? I, think we, I think we agree with that. And so one aspect of the food environment that has always interested me has been diets, because that is, that is one, one, one element that, that, we've, uh, that we obviously see. And, um, and, and it's part of the solution that people think in, to, try and, to try and actually fix, fix, fix their illness, diets. And this is what I want to talk to you guys about today. Now, diets is an interesting term. Diets come from the diet. The word diet comes from the Greek word dieta for a, a way of life. And, and what a beautiful word that is because that's what food is food should be a way of life unfortunately the term diet in the context in which we use it today has i would like to argue you know now has a great a great deal of toxicity associated with it it's all about removal it's all about punishment it's all about sin it's 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 you know and and, and where has the joy of food of, of, of food gone and now there are any number of different reasons why people go on diets. Maybe you've just become type two diabetic. Maybe you've got irritable bowel syndrome. Maybe you've got high blood pressure. Um, but actually, for the vast majority of people, um, um, some of you may, may may be out there. When we talk about diets, when we talk about going on a diet, we mean weight loss. Okay. And there are a whole lot of diets that are that that are actually out there that we can actually see. And you can see a whole group of them here. And I'll touch on some of these um, 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 here. And I was interested, and, and in fact, some of these you might consider fad diets. You might look, oh, this, why is he going to talk about that? They sound fatty. And so I was inter interested in actually if any of these actually work. Now, some of these are actually entirely, for lack of a better term, BS. Okay, And this being the University of Cambridge, um, th this is a, a scholarly uh, a center. I will talk about only the science-based uh, um, diets. But what is actually surprising um, that I found surprising anyway, is that the vast majority of diets that are out there, including many, if not all of these that are here, actually do work, at least for some people, at least in the short to medium term, just very rarely for the reasons that are sold on their publicity bump, on the side of the tin, on their web page, what, what, what have you. And so I became interested in about the truth about diets. How do these diets, which of these diets work, and how do they actually work? And, act, and, and what I have um, um, realized is that the diets that work, work for some very, very simple reasons. 
There's no magic. And this is what I want to talk to you guys um, um, about today. So th this is really what this talk is based on, on, on this book. It's my first book. Um, it's Gene Eating. The one on the left-hand side is the UK cover. The one on the right-hand side is the, um, is, is, is the US cover. But when I was walking around and going to speak to, to publishers to try, and, to try and get the book published, um, all the publishers, okay, to, to every single uh, publisher asked me this question after they, after they read what I, what I said them. They go, wh wh where's your plan? What, what's your plan? I'm going, what plan? They said, the diet, your diet plan, the yo plan. I'm going, there's no yo plan. And and there isn't. And and the reason why there's no yo plan is because there's no singular plan that actually that actually does um, work. However, as I was going through the process of writing this book, what I did realize and what I began to realize is there were a number of truths that emerged. Okay. Now these truths are anchored in biological facts and therefore are not. By its very definition, by its very definition, not fatty. Um, so I've called rather narcissistically. I have called them <clears throat> yo truths. Now this is sort of just as a pastiche from the yo diet plan. Um, but I found six of them. Okay, there are probably more, but there are six truths I'm going to talk to you guys about today. This is the way the talk is structured. Truth one to six. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on some truths than others, but that's roughly speaking what we are going to do. I'll hopefully speak for about forty to forty-five minutes, and I'm very happy to take any um, questions that you might that you guys might have. All right. So your truth number one: when we're talking about weight loss, what do you guys think about it? I think I know what most people think about it. It's not easy. It's difficult. Why is it so difficult? It ain't easy. Your truth number one. It ain't supposed to be easy. That's right. I'm all the the, the wonderful advice uh, coming from here, and um, and this is the reason. Okay, why it is not why it's not easy. Now you guys would have seen variations on this, you know, scales of justice before. Okay, and um, this is the energy balance so called equation, and what. <laughs> this is it's otherwise known as the first law of thermodynamics. You can't invent energy from, from, from anywhere. You can't, and you certainly can't magic the energy away. The only way you can gain weight, ladies and gentlemen, is to eat more than you burn. And the only way to lose weight is to burn more than you eat. I know what you guys are thinking. This is, we just came on to this at 6 p.m. when I could be doing something else to hear some dude say, eat less and move more. Are you kidding me? And I'm not kidding you because it's true, because it's physics. It's a fundamental law. But that is the how, okay? That is how we get to the body weight we actually uh, get to. The more interesting question to ask is why? Why do people behave so differently around food? Why do some people respond to um, stress by eating and some people respond to stress by not eating? It's the same hormone as cortisol. But yet there's a diametrically opposite response to stress. And you guys know who you are, right? Whether or not you eat when you're stressed or not. Why do some people appear to feel hungry all the time? Others take longer to become full. Why are they some people who use food as fuel? And other people like me who live for eating, who love their food. How come some people use food um, as a reward? They comfort eat. How come other people can eat without even knowing that they're, that, that they're eating? So these are different behaviors around food. So, and what they do is they then influence the physics, okay? Because of our different behaviors and likes and dislikes and how we actually act around food, this then influences the physics of how much we eat, which therefore influences our, our, our body weight. And I am interested and I've always been interested in why different people behave differently around, around food. Why is there this biological variation? And whenever we talk about biological variation, we have to talk about genes, right? Because your genes, after all, are what encodes the, the, the biology. And the biology of body weight and the biology of food intake, like the biology of many other human systems, okay, has roots in twin studies, okay, where we actually understand uh, the genetics by studying twins. So, so, so why twins? So I'll briefly praise it. Some of you may know, um, but I'll just praise it so we're on the same uh, level of understanding. Clearly, they're going to be identical twins and non-identical twins. So identical twins are, for all intents and purposes, genetic clones of each other. Okay, so they share hundred percent of genetic material, whereas non-identical twins, fraternal twins, um, would share as much genetic material as you would with your with your own siblings, or for that matter, your parents. 
50%. So you could take any given trait, and if you study it in, in enough twins, you should be able to work out the heritability of that given trait, meaning that a percentage of the variation in a trait that's going to be down to your genes versus the environment. All right. So let me give you a couple of examples. If I had hair, my hair would be black. Now, hair color is very powerfully genetically influenced with very little environmental impact. Dyeing your hair does not count. I'm talking about natural hair color. Okay. Now, how about another trait, freckles? Now, freckles are clearly going to have an, a, a genetic influence as well, but how many appear, okay, uh, uh, if they appear at all, would entirely depend on whether or not I like to wear T-shirts. Do I like to stand in the sun? So there we have a powerfully genetically influenced trait with an equally powerful environmental impact. As it turns out, every single human trait and behavior, every single human trait and behavior has a genetic influence. The trick the difficulty in very many ways is trying to understand the impact of the environment. Okay, How do our genes interact with the environment? Any geneticist which tells you that they only study genes in isolation is not a very good geneticist because the way, because our environment influences our genes, they do not act in isolation from, 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 our, from, our, um, from the environment. Okay, So if you actually do that math, Okay, then what you find out is that the heritability of body weight is actually 70%. So it's certainly not zero. It isn't 100% either. But just to put things in perspective, the heritability of height, which I don't think anyone here would disagree has a huge genetic influence, is 85%. So it's certainly approaching that of height. So now what are some of these genes okay, that, that, that we're talking about? You know, is, is Do we actually know what they do? And we actually do know what quite a few of them do. So this is a, a very simplistic um, uh, schema of how we consider food intake control. And it's a top-down control. So your brain controls your food intake, right? Now, your brain needs to know two pieces of information in order to influence your food intake. It needs to know, A, how much fat you have. Because how much fat you have is how long you would last in the wild without any food. So if your food sources stop today, how long would you survive for? Clearly not an issue we'd face today. We have too much food. But given that we never had enough food through, through the vast majority of evolution, this was an important piece of information, important integer to actually hold in your head. The second piece of information that your brain, and, and these are going to be, and your brain understands this from hormones that are secreted from fat. Okay, The second piece of information your brain needs to do in order to influence food intake is your short term uh, are your short term caloric uh, um, um, intake. So, in other words, what you're eating now and what you have just eaten. And these signals are going to come from your gut, your gastrointestinal uh, uh, tract. Um, once again, they release hormones as you eat, and these hormones circulate in the blood and actually uh, signal to the, to the brain. What your brain does is it responds and translates these signals, therefore influencing your next interaction with a fridge, a menu, or a supermarket. The genetic modifiers I'm talking about run throughout this entire process. So I'll just give you a couple of examples what these do. We, we know a lot of biology, but just some of the key ones. Okay, So there are some of these genes, for example, which influence the sensitivity of your brain to sensing your signals from fat. What do I mean by this? Imagine if you carry 20 kilos of fat, Okay, 20 kilograms of fat. And so there should be the equivalent of 20 kilograms of fat of hormonal level circulating in the blood. But if your brain was slightly less sensitive to this and only sensed 18 kilos, well, then it's going to think 18 kilos, 18, I thought they were 20. And what your brain does is drives you to eat more to try and get you to 20 kilos, but you already are at 20 kilos, so you get larger, all right? Now, how about, how about the short-term signals? And you see where I'm going with here. So say, imagine you've had 1,000 calories for dinner or lunch. Okay, but your brain only senses 800 of the calories because of the because of its insensitivity. It then drives you to eat more than what you have already actually eaten, which is how you could be there with your partner, your your uh, family, you know, and anyone, your friend. Okay, and eat order exactly the same thing of 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 a menu, but yet one of you feels hungry even when you finish all the food, whereas someone else is is nicely sated and nicely and nicely full. For some people, it is always going to be more difficult to say no. For some people, it is always going to be very difficult. And actually, it doesn't matter how skinny you are, how many six-packs you have. I have a two-pack. 
one pack actually, I don't have a two pack. Um, it doesn't actually matter because it doesn't matter how skinny you are because your brain hates it when you lose any weight at all. Okay, the moment you begin to lose weight, no matter how skinny you are, your brain begins to rave a big red flag saying that, ah, ah, okay, this is, you have, have just reduced your chances of surviving. Okay, and so therefore it does its best to drag yourself kicking and screaming up to the weight you were before, even after you've lost just a few pounds. It ain't easy because your brain doesn't make it easy. Your truth number two, eat a little less of everything. And this is otherwise known as moderation. Now, this is the kind of advice that's not going to make me any money, and that's okay. See, the problem with moderation is twofold. Moderation is boring. It is boring. You got to do everything just a little bit less of everything. It's also difficult. It's also actually quite quite tough. Let me give you one, one, one quick example, all right? For, for whatever reason, the powers that be have decreed that pasta, dry pasta, is served in 75 gram serving sizes, all right? But they're manufactured and packed in 500 gram packages and containers. Now, anyone can do the straight math, and 500 is not divisible into 75. That's the first problem, okay? So you end up with leftover pasta everywhere. And second, who weighs pasta? I'm, have you tried weighing spaghetti? The spaghetti goes everywhere. So what you do is you kind of tip it in, don't you? You go, oh, 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 500 grams have gone in. Anyway, so sometimes maybe it's easier not to have the pasta in the house. Okay, that's not what I want to talk to you guys about today. What I wanted to talk to you guys in Yo Truth number two was about the current in vogue uh, um, dietary practice of removing entire food groups from your diet with no clinical, um, um, for no clinical uh, rationale, okay, all in the name of health. And we've seen, we've seen versions of this, right? Gluten-free, okay, lacto gluten-free, right? So yes, 1% of the human species are celiac, allergic to gluten, and for Pete's sake, stay away from gluten. Actually, three to four percent of the of, of the population um, are probably genuinely gluten intolerant, and this can range anywhere from being slightly farty to to you know severe intestinal distress. And you probably better stay away from gluten as well. So that's five percent, okay? But yet, twenty five percent of us in certainly in Europe, certainly in North America, Australasia, have bought gluten free at any point. So much so, it's become. Um, it's become a monetizable uh, thing to be gluten free. You can take now goods which have no, which never had gluten in it. They're gluten free naturally, and say they're gluten free. Gluten free rice. Rice does not have gluten. Okay, there's no need to say gluten free water. Gluten free shampoo. Google it. I'm not joking. Okay, hundreds of millions of hits on gluten free shampoo. What is going on? Anyway, 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 I am. Um, um, meandering, I'm going off topic here. I want to focus on two things. I want to talk about dairy-free, okay? So the big movement to say that dairy is not particularly good for you, we need to remove dairy from your diet, okay? And the second thing I want to talk about is removing meat-based protein from your diet, being vegan, okay? So these two hot topics, I'll try and cover in the next, uh, um, in, in, in the next few minutes. So let's focus on dairy first. So did you know Ladies and gentlemen, that twenty percent, up to twenty percent of the dairy that the dairy that we get from your supermarket today, hasn't actually emerged from a from an animal, okay? Because they're plant based, okay? And you can go and this these sections in the supermarkets are getting bigger and bigger. Now, I am ethnically Chinese, and so I have drunk, for example, soy milk forever, all right? Except Chinese people don't call it milk; we call it a broth, and we certainly wouldn't have count, countenanced putting it into milk, but you white people are going to do what you got to do, all right? Now, then there are other weird things. Quinoa milk. I mean, how do you milk a quinoa? I, it's, just, it's, just an, it's, it's just an amazing thing. And I'm just thinking about things the other day where you can actually now, if you look at all of the various things here, you can have an entirely free from Christmas these days. You can have a Christmas of absolutely nothing. Anyway, anyway, focus, focus, focus. I'm not, I'm not focusing. So now, I am ethnically Chinese, and so I am lactose intolerant, famously. Okay, Chinese people can't drink milk. I can't drink milk, okay, as an adult. So lactose intolerance is actually a misnomer in very many ways because by its very definition, by our very characteristics as mammals, we were able to drink milk, all of us, the vast majority of us, to drink milk as babies. Okay, this is the, this is a universal characteristic of, of the vast majority, if not all, if not all mammals. 
But what is interesting is that actually almost all mammals, including the majority of the human species, become lactose intolerant as they go into adulthood. In fact, two thirds of the world uh, are lactose intolerant as adults and are unable to drink milk in large in large volumes. So two questions, um, how and why? Okay, so the how. So lactose is a sugar, okay, um, like glucose, like fructose. Um, but mammals cannot digest, cannot absorb lactose as it is. It needs to be metabolized. It needs to be digested into glucose and galactose. Okay, that's what makes lactose. And it's done um, using an enzyme called lactase. And lactase sits on the um, the border, sort of like on the surface of your small intestine, so that when lactase goes in, a lactose goes in, lactase chops it into two, and we're able to absorb it. Okay. Now, the thing is, lactase. Here's the lactase gene. Okay. As you get older. Okay, and as all mammals get older, including kitty cats, okay, what happens is a protein comes upstream of the lactase gene and binds, turning the lactase gene off so that it is no longer produced, certainly is no longer produced at high amounts, such as in me, and so I can no longer drink milk as, um, as an adult. But and, and you guys are thinking, well, hang on a second, hang on a second, okay, those of you of European descent saying, how come I can drink milk? So all of this change okay with the oh no then the question is how so, so so that was the how let me go with the why first pardon me i was jumping ahead of myself why why did this uh, uh, evolutionary um, um adaptation occur to stop us drinking milk as adults probably to uh incentivize a rapidly growing mammal to move to solid food you know a there's limited space Okay, so if university age Johnny is still clamped on, right? There's no room for little Johnny, and so what happens is if 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 university age Johnny is suddenly incentivized to go eat solid food, there makes more room. This is likely to be likely to be the case. So so how come U Europeans and some other people in the world can actually drink milk? Well, all of this changed with the domestication of large mammals, particularly ruminants. Okay, so cows, sheep, goats. And when people begin to realize that, well, hang on a second, if we drank the milk and also ate the cheese from this animal, we would get a hell of a lot more calories than if we just ate the animal for meat. And in fact, there are paleo agriculturists who are a thing, okay, who've calculated that in a Neolithic cow, so a cave cow, all right, um, would produce somewhere in the region of seven to 800 liters of milk per year, all right? Now compare this to a modern Holstein Frisian cow who produces 10,000 liters, but we shan't go there. But even at that seven to 800 liters of milk, we are talking 10 times the number of calories during the lifespan of a, of, of a cow from the milk than just from the meat itself. Okay, so keeping in mind we never had enough food to eat, if you suddenly had 10 times more calories available to you, that was a huge selection pressure in order to be able to adapt, to be able to drink the milk, to be able to eat the cheese. Okay, so 7,500 years ago, plus or minus, a mutation was either carried in or, or mutated within Europe itself, where it was at, where, where, Copen, where Denmark actually now sits, okay, where this dark spot over, over here. And this mutation, one base pair change, happened upstream of the lactase gene, which prevents the protein, which normally shuts off lactase, from being able to bind. Okay, so that it doesn't bind, lactase is turned on, and suddenly those people are able to drink milk as adults. 85 to 90 percent of Northern European white Caucasians can drink milk as adults. All of you, every single one of you, has exactly that same single base pair change that was brought in to Europe 7,500 years ago. Okay, So that's why you adapted to a new food source, which is why you can drink milk as adults, and, and I can't. So latte or soy latte? Well, look, I mean, it's clearly, if you're lactose intolerant like me, then it better be a soy latte, but I prefer black coffee. But if you can drink milk, then remember this. Lactose is lactose. It is a sugar. Okay, There is no difference between whether or not it comes from human milk, ick, cow milk, goat milk, sheep milk, camel milk. It is all the same. So if you have the adaptation to be able to drink milk as an adult, then milk then dairy per se is not bad for you. Now, clearly, if you drink too much milk, eat too much cheese and ice cream, there is a waistline issue. But that's a different discussion um, um, to, to, to have. Fine. How about plant-based 
uh, 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 foods, okay? So being vegan. Now, one of the things which I have um, previously done is be a, uh, a presenter for the BBC documentary, Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. And so um, one time a few years ago, the producers asked me whether or not I would explore whether or not it's healthy to be vegan. Now, there are any number of reasons to go vegan. Um, a lot of people do it for ethical reasons. A lot of people do it for environmental reasons or a combination of the, of, of, of the two. But this was a healthcare program. And so we were, I was tasked with investigating the health aspects of, of being. So I'll just focus on the health aspects um, um, I'm here. Okay. So I guess the first question is, you know, is, being, is vegan food just generally per se healthier for you? Okay. And I guess if you think a little bit about it, the answer is going to be no. It depends what you eat. I could have spent my the 29 days, not that I was counting, that I was vegan, I could have spent it eating chips, Oreos, and no one in their right mind would call that a healthy diet. Um, so it does depend what it does depend what you eat. I even found this marvelous product, this marvelous product. So these are bacon rashers, okay, savory and crunchy. At, look, at, look at the bottom here. No artificial flavors or colors. Mm-hmm but entirely vegan. What is this magical product? Anyway, as it turns out, when it says no artificial flavors or colorings, there's no artificial bacon flavorings or colorings rather than, no, it's probably like smoked turmeric and, and smoked paprika and turmeric or, some, or something. Anyway, I could have spent the entire time eating that, um, but that would have been not a good idea. So what I chose, instead of being vegan per se, um, I went plant-based, which means that uh, which is a which is a a version of being vegan in which you eat whole foods. Okay, so I ate pulses and lentils and 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 that kind of and that kind of thing, right? And I stayed away from energy dense products such as such as chips. Twenty nine days. So what were the scores on the door? Well, um, I lost nearly eleven pounds in twenty nine days just eating this plant based diet. First, secondly, my blood cholesterol levels dropped by twelve percent. I mean, come on, I'm like the new poster boy for veganism, for plant-based. I should start an Instagram account. I should tweet. But I guess the question is why? And this is what I want to encourage all of you to think about things. When you talk about diets, when, when you talk about why did the diet work for this newly minted Instagram guru? Okay, so let's deal with weight loss first. Listen, as it turns out, why did I lose weight? Because plant-based foods are a lot bulkier, for lack of a better term, than animal-based foods. What I mean is you have to eat a lot of lentils to match the calories in a steak. And there's only so much time in a day you have for chewing, right? So what happens is while I ate more gross in terms of weight, I absorbed fewer calories because the caloric density of plant-based foods is a lot, is, is, is a lot lower. And as I said, there's only so much time you, uh, in a day you can eat. I lost weight. And remember, I didn't go on a diet. I just changed my food. I lost weight because I absorbed fewer calories. But, and I find it a useful strategy. So even today, I am flexitarian. So I'm vegan probably two or three times, uh, two or three times a week, okay? Because it's a useful strategy for me. But it doesn't mean it suits everybody. Because you can eat less just by eating less. Intermittent fasting, you can eat less by doing any number of different things that are there. It doesn't necessarily have to be magical vegan diet, okay? As long as you can stick with it and you can eat less. How about my blood cholesterol levels? Well, I know that my blood cholesterol levels dropped, well, probably because I lost some weight and blood cholesterol levels are linked to your are linked to your weight. But actually, the primary reason my blood cholesterol levels dropped was because I removed saturated fats from my diet. Now, I appreciate that there are um, plant-based saturated fats, have plant-based sources of saturated fats, such as coconut milk, famously. Um, but I knew that for me, my diet, that the vast majority of my saturated fats would have come from animal-based food, okay? Um, so this is why my cholesterol levels dropped. But there are two buts to this, to, to, to this tale. The first is I would have achieved exactly the same result had I moved to a pescatarian diet, eating largely fish, because fish is full of unsaturated fats, okay? I didn't need to move to a vegan diet in order, in order to achieve this. And secondly, my blood cholesterol levels happen to be um, sensitive to diets. And for some of you out there, they're not going to be. Some of your uh, blood cholesterol levels are going to be uh, um, set as high, medium, or low. Lucky you if it's low. But for, for those of you who are set high because of whatever genetic propensity you have, then the only way to lower your cholesterol levels is going to be through drugs such as statins. Okay, And you're just never going to lower it via diets. So it's always important to understand 
why and how a diet works, particularly with someone trying to sell that diet to you, it doesn't necessarily mean it will work for you. Now, your truth number three and number four are, are very closely linked. And I want to argue, explain how the vast majority of diets that do work, work. Okay? So just bear with me here as I link, I interlink the two of them. So your truth number three, food that takes longer to digest generally makes you feel fuller. And this comes from our understanding, okay, of our food to cook tube, our gastrointestinal tract, okay? And, and the reason why this works as it does is because the moment you put anything in your mouth and start chewing and swallows and it goes all the way through till it comes out the other side, your gut secretes hormones and, and up to 20 different hormones. And it, this mix of hormones informs your brain, what you're eating, and makes you feel fuller. Okay, so let me give you um, um, just 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 an example. Let's start with macronutrients. So a calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb, in that order. Why? Because protein, okay, in the form of amino acids, once we've actually broken it down, is chemically the most complex to dis to disassemble to metabolize. It takes takes longer. Okay, as a result, it travels further down the gut, and as a result, it makes you feel fuller, you eat less. Okay, so let me just give, just have some examples of, of, of what some of these diets are. Let's start with the Atkins diet, so-called the, the granddaddy of all the diets that actually that, that, that actually you would have heard of. Famously low carb, people are counting carbs, how many carbs are you having? Carb, no carb, no carb. Actually, it's less about the carbs. It has a little bit to do with the carbs, but less about it other than the fact that it's actually a high in protein diet. Now, people say, well, but I you increase the amount of fat. It's true, you do, but fat per se by itself is actually quite unpalatable. Fat and carbs are delicious, okay, but we'll leave that alone for a second. Um, so a Natkin's diet is actually a high-protein diet. And so therefore, when you actually have a high-protein diet, as I said, you feel fuller, you eat less, you lose weight. And this is how all the rest of these diets work. So paleo, okay, this is like the Flintstone fantasy, okay, and this is high in protein gluten-free. My son, that's not high in protein. It is because for a lot of people who go gluten-free and some people who go grain and gluten-free, it actually becomes a very low-carb diet because that's where a vast majority of your carbs come from. So you end up eating more meat, more protein, more protein. And so therefore you, you end up being, being full and, and actually l lose weight. So before all of you start going out and rushing out to buy steak, any protein, whether or not it comes from uh, a tofu or comes from beans will have the same effect. It doesn't have to be meat. Okay, all protein has the same characteristic of taking longer to 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 digest. The other thing which takes longer to digest and actually improves your fullness as well is fiber. Okay, now this is how the plant-based diet works because it's full of fiber and fiber you don't digest at all. It comes up, you, you eat it, and it comes out the other side. But it slows the release of items, including um, including fat and including sugar. It slows the release of this, takes it longer to to to, to digest, having the same effect as, as 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 having the protein. Foods that take longer to digest make you feel fuller. Okay, hold that thought. Yo, truth number four. Don't blindly count calories. So what is a calorie? A calorie or a kilocalorie. We, we use the term calorie, but we actually mean kilocalorie. And a kilocalorie is the amount of um, heat, the amount of energy it takes to heat one liter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. Okay. So it is a unit of energy. Okay. So therefore, people say, well, that's why all calories are equal. It doesn't matter where it comes from because a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. That is true if you're actually able to extract all the calories from a given food, right? So we have to consider, which is not true, we have to consider caloric availability. Caloric availability is the amount of calories you can extract from a food versus the total number of calories locked up in that food. So let me give you some, some, some examples. So if we consider sugar, now sugar is our base fuel, okay? And so if you have 100 calories of sugar, you get pretty close to 100 calories of sugar when you eat it, probably 97 calories or so. Because why? Sugar is typically sucrose. Um, this is table sugar, which is uh, uh, glucose and fructose. And so just one, just one cut and we absorb it all, very little energy involved. But imagine if you have 100 calories of sweet corn or corn on the cob. Now, you, you can eat that and then look in the loo the next day and realize you have absorbed 
nowhere close to 100 calories of sweet corn, all right? But yet, when you take sweet corn, you desiccate it, you pound it into a cornmeal, you make it into a corn tortilla, you make it into cornbread, suddenly a far greater percentage of the calories are available than if you just ate the sweet corn whole, okay? So, but yet, when you go to a supermarket and look at the back of the pack, it says 100 calories of sweet corn and 100 calories of corn tortilla, right? It does matter where the calories come from in terms of how the food is processed because we cannot extract all of the calories that are, that, that are, actually, stuck, that are actually stuck in the food. So let me give you another, another uh, example that is not quite as extreme. Okay, steak. This is a fillet steak. Say 400 calories. Imagine that. How long would you cook it for medium rare? I don't know, depending on how big it is. Probably five, six minutes maybe. Even if you wanted to murder the steak and do it gray, well done, then you'd cook it for 15 minutes. But imagine if you take exactly the same piece of meat, okay, ground it up, put it into a tomato sauce, boil it for two hours, layer it into a lasagna, cook it for another two hours, and then freeze the lasagna because who finishes the whole lasagna, okay? And then reheat it the next day for another hour before you actually eat it. So suddenly the same piece of meat which has taken me only five to 10 minutes to cook, suddenly has been cooked for five hours, right? The caloric availability in the meat within the lasagna is always going to be higher than a piece of meat that you've cooked on the grill. Don't get me wrong. I love steak. I love lasagna. My point is blindly counting calories for the sake of it makes no sense. Okay, we have to know where the calories come from. Now, calories do have their use, okay? So clearly, if you're eating, well, I'm going to halve the, the number of calories of steak that I eat, well, then, then you're halving the portion. Or calorie uh, um, counts at point of purchase. So if you go to your favorite coffee shop and suddenly you realize, oh my God, the blueberry muffin is 400 calories, it does give you pause for thought. And people do, uh, uh, my colleagues at the MRC Epidemiology Unit have shown that point of, of uh, purchase calories reduce your chances of purchasing a specific food and presumably consuming it by about 8%. So it does have its role. But blindly counting calories when you're on some magical 400 calorie a day diet makes absolutely no sense when you don't know where the calories have come from. Okay. So if you actually look at this principle of caloric availability, then this is how these diets work. So once again, I'll go back to plant based. Okay. I talked about this. Uh, uh, lentils, there's only so much time. The bulk. Okay, look, we know the lentils, what? They look like a flying saucer when they go in. They look like a flying saucer when it comes out the other side. Nothing much has happened to it because of the fiber, because of its, because of its structure, because it has low caloric availability. How about something like the, uh, um, the Mediterranean diet? Once again, that's full, of whole, uh, that's full of whole grains, and so therefore very, really low caloric availability. And why have I listed paleo and gluten-free and the high-protein diets? Because of the caloric availability of protein. Now, the caloric availability of carbohydrates, depending if you're talking refined carbohydrates, which is roughly 95 to 97%, or complex carbohydrates, starches, which are going to be 92 to 94%, okay, which means that for every 100 calories, you get anywhere from 92 to 97% of calories. How about fat? Well, fat is very energy dense. Okay, so it's about 97 to 98% available. So 98, if you eat 100 calories of fat, you get about 97 to 98%, 98, 90, 98, 97, 98 calories. But protein, depending on how it's cooked, obviously, will only ever be on average 70% available, which means, which means that for every 100 calories of protein that you eat, you will only ever be able to extract roughly 70 calories from it because it takes so much time and energy to break apart proteins, which is how these, these diets work. And so if you actually take any given, any given diet that's out there that someone says works and consider the two principles, does it take longer to digest? And does it, have, does it change the caloric availability of food that you're actually eating? Now, if it and and those two rules are gonna be there, and if some magical diet that's actually out there probably does achieve that, then there's a fighting chance that those diets might work, and maybe you want to try it out. Okay. Now, your truth number five. The last two are, are gonna be very quick, actually. If, um, um, don't worry. I know you guys are looking at your watch. Uh, the, 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 your truth number five: eat more unsaturated fats. Now, we've dealt with this already, uh, in part in my in my vegan experiments. So, famously. 
um, unsaturated fats are available from plant-based sources, so avocados, uh, um, you know, nuts, olive oil, but also from fish. Okay. Now there are a myriad of ep epidemiological studies which who now show which now shows that if you change the ratio of unsaturated to saturated fats, so eat more unsaturated fats versus saturated fats, it reduces all cause mortality, deadness. Okay. Now the mechanisms are clearly complicated. It depends on all the things I've talked about previously already, including your genes, including what kind of fat and where it comes from. Um, but it's a pretty safe rule, I would say, to play in life that if you were to eat more unsaturated fats than saturated fats, I think that's a, a pretty safe way to actually, to, to, to actually go. And finally, don't fear food. Now, this doesn't seem like it's anchored in any biology at all, and it probably isn't in, 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 very, in very many ways. And what do I mean by fearing, by fearing food? So this is uh, goop. I don't want to drive clicks towards um, um, towards Gwyneth Paltrow's lifestyle webpage, but but anyway, um, where they are trying to Gwyneth. Yes, I know her. I don't. I don't know Gwyneth. Is trying to sell the trying to achieve your leanest livable weight. Google it. I'm not making this up. All right, leanest livable weight. That's like as skinny as you can be without dying, isn't that right? And if that doesn't personify a fear of food. I don't know what else does. Now, listen, is it true? This is from Trudes, okay. Is it true that the vast majority of non-communicable disease burden today, there's obviously a communicable disease issue at the moment, but non-communicable disease, non-infectious disease burden, that it is diet related? Undoubtedly, this includes obesity, which is what I study, type 2 diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, hypertension, high blood pressure. Okay, yes, they all have a diet related element. So, do we need to fix our diet? Yes, we do. But why do we have to do it through fear? What have I spent the last 40 minutes talking about? I've spent the last 40 minutes talking about, I love my food, talking about food, understanding food, understanding how our food interacts with us. You want to love your food. You want to know your food. You just want to eat a little bit less of, of, of the food, all right? And I don't think fearing food is going to be of any use whatsoever. But I guess here's the question. So here's the book, Gene Eating Once, uh, um, 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 once Again. But this is the $64 million question. But hang on a second. Hang on a second. How do I lose weight and keep it off? So look, the first thing is you have to do you. Now, when I mean that, I mean you got to do what suits your biology, but you also have to do what suits your lifestyle, okay? So in other words, do you work shifts? Are you a parent? Do you commute to work? Uh, you know, what, 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 do you, what, do you actually, what do you actually do? Why is this important? Because some diets are not going to suit you being a parent uh, or exercising or anything that is there or, or working shifts. And if, you, and if the diet that you choose, should you need to lose weight, does not suit your lifestyle or your biology, you're not going to be able to stick to it, okay? And if you're not going to be able to stick to it, it's not going to work. People say that 95% of diets fail. 95% of diets don't fail. 95% of diets we can't stick to because the diet only works when you can stick with it. And what that means is that in, in addition to you doing you, you have to pick something and, and do something which is not extreme. Now, clearly, I can go on a seven-day water fast diet. It's a thing. Will I lose weight? Of course, I'm going to lose weight because I'm not eating anything. But the moment I start eating, all the weight is actually going to come back on, right? And so you have to pick something that not only that suits you, but you can sustain. Now, this sounds very depressing. But what that does mean is you can't do anything crazy and you can't do on, on for the most part anything extreme because otherwise you won't be able to stick to it and finally to misquote a wonderful author everything in moderation including moderation ladies and gentlemen it's been a pleasure to speak to you as always and i'm very happy to take questions so i'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see my lovely visage okay hello right so I think I'm running my own my own Q and A. So let's see what's happening on the right hand side. Okay. Um, oh, this. Okay. There's a question. Just let me see what happens here. I'm trying to see if I can if I can run 
Thank you. All right. So, so the first question here appears to be about um, how come I can't actually move this? Hang on, just let me see if I can move this up and down, guys. I haven't practiced this this um, this thing here. Um, all right, I'll deal with the epigenetics question first. There's a number of of, of questions here from Miras um, with regards to um, epigenetics. So epigenetics are, I think, most of, uh, many of you will know, but I'll just I'll just recap so we're all on the same same level of understanding. So we have clearly our genes, um, which don't change. Okay, you born that they're, they're the same the day you born and the same the day you die, but you can change the decorations on your uh, um, on on your DNA. And these are called epigenetic modifications. And what these epigenetic modifications do is they change the ability of your genes to be turned on or to be turned or to be turned off, or how much they're turned on and turned off. Okay, so this will obviously have a have, have a very big role to 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 actually play. But the problem with epigenetics is twofold. First of all, it's volatile. Okay, meaning that it changes because by its very definition, it responds to the environment. Do I smoke? Are you stressed? Did I have a trauma? Um, um, any number of di di different things, but it's also tissue specific. Okay, so now while we understand the epigenetics of something like exercise, because we can get access, slightly painful, but we can access to your muscle, uh, we can get access to fat. In order to understand the epigenetics of food and take control, we need access to the brain, and we still don't have a good way. <laughs> of ethically, legally getting into the brain. Yeah, um, it, we. I'm now working, for example, and I have access to post-mortem human brain samples, and so we're able to to actually begin to, to to think about things and working on that. But that is the reason why the epigenetics of obesity is still a really an an embryonic an embryonic um, um field. So, okay, so I can see. There's no scrolling. Don't worry. I'm just going to answer the question as it actually uh, um comes out. What do I think about all meat-based diets. This is carnivore. Okay, I met a guy. I met a guy at a at a party once. This is just a, this is just a story. So so look, I sometimes I drink a little bit too much Merlot or something like that, and I it let slips that that sometimes I work on diets because this at a dinner party everyone wants to talk about. Anyway, this dude said I'm on the carnivore diet. I'm going, oh dude, and uh, and he got me to feel his biceps. I didn't want to feel his biceps. All right, but anyway, um, I think it's a dumb idea. I think it works because people actually clearly lose weight. Why? Because it's a high protein diet. Okay. Um, and then for all the reasons I've actually told you, the problem is, all right, we are not carnivores. We can't extract the, some of the essential minerals from, from the carnivore diet, vitamin C, for example. And where is the fiber coming from? Okay. We need fiber in order to keep our, our gut, a uh, microbiota um, happy and, 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 you know, clapping. So I think it's a really dumb idea. I don't think the health, I don't think the safety studies have actually been done. Now the carnivore diet is very different from being keto, which means that you can still eat vegetables and still eat things like that. That's a different discussion. I think the carnivore diet is a really stupid thing to a stupid thing to do. Okay, so how does low energy oh how does low energy availability um I can, I can see this. Is anyone sending me the questions? Uh, okay, we're gonna freestyle this. So sorry, guys. We're gonna we're just gonna have to see what what the questions is. They come. I can't scroll the questions. Um, male female differences. Um, how do male female differences change? Which diets may be more beneficial, healthy, and effective? Now that's a very that's a very good question. So males, just want to point out. Okay, speaking as a fellow male, are, are very simple creatures. We're born. Um, we think about food and we think about the other thing. Those are the only things we think about and we die, all right? Females, however, I want to argue are actually, uh, uh, depending on whether or not you have a child, four different, entirely different species almost, okay? You have the woman pre-baby, you have the woman as they're pregnant. Now, when you're pregnant, you actually become almost an entirely different species. Why? Because you're trying to keep a parasite, I'm a father here, folks, in you for nine months, feed it, you know, and, and, and everything like that. So you have to kind of hotwire your whole biology to keep the baby in there. So that the woman being pregnant, the woman post-baby, and, and the woman post-menopause. Okay, so we know, for example, those ladies who are like rubber bands. Maybe some of you are there, where you can you can, can you, know, you kind of like give birth and you kind of spring back to the weight you were. Whereas other uh, other women, very many women, do not lose the baby weight. Okay, now what is the difference between the the pre-pregnant woman, the pregnant woman, the post uh, um, the, the the mother, okay, and the postmenopausal woman? Your hormonal levels, and so there are going to be differences, um, certainly in body shape. 
okay and certainly in response to a lot of things because of your huge difference in 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 your estrogen to, to testosterone levels and other hormones that are there so undoubtedly they're going to be there are going to be differences what is interesting is once you actually go past the menopause and your estrogen levels plummet drop okay now people think that women don't have testosterone people do women do have this testosterone just that it's, it's a ratio issue but as a woman's uh, um, estrogen levels uh, drop po post-menopause what happens is an androgenization actually occurs where in effect your body begins to see it more like a male profile i'm not saying in any pejorative fashion and so therefore a post-menopause woman can sometimes change shape into a more male shape with more central obesity and things right sorry i'm, I'm kind of jumping here um, thank you so much. On the subject of your truth number six, please could I ask if you know of any biological genetic basis for the concept of intuitive eating? Very good question. So um, I think intuitive eating does work for some people as a strategy. Okay, so for example, um, there is a um, an example which I which I give in terms of feeding behavior. All right, this is the Monday morning meeting scenario. Okay, so where you you sat around the table and someone brings a plate of cookies. Okay. Now, there are four different behaviors. The first behavior, me, is before the plate of cookies even stops sliding, I already picked a cookie up and I'm eating it. <laughs> okay. The second behavior are people who long for the cookie. They want the cookie. They're looking at the cookie as it's going by, but they don't pick it up for whatever internal algorithm and as a result, ignore the rest of the meeting. You know who you are, right? That's the third type. And these, is the, uh, uh, these are the, the, the people who don't, the most annoying, who don't even know the cookies have arrived. What cookie? I didn't see the cookie. But the fourth type, this is the, the, my relevance here, are the people who eat the cookie without even knowing they've had the cookie, okay? Because they just eat without thinking about it. Now, it is in those people who intuitive eating will, will uh, make the most sense. Because what happens is you're forcing yourself to think about, well, well, hang on a second. Would I have eaten the cookie if, the cook if I knew the cookie was there? Right, and so that works there. But if, for example, you are one of those folks I'm talking about, in, in which your brain is slightly less sensitive to the signal, so you feel hungry all the time, well, then intuitive eating, listen to your intuition, would mean that you constantly eat more. You are you are not trying to fight the signals; you're then going with it. So I think intuitive eating works for some people, depending on your feeding behavior. It won't work for others. Right. Um, Thank you so much. Oh, that, that's it. So thank you, Dr. Yo. Go Wolfpack, a Wolfson person. Woo! Since menopause and my estrogen diet, oh, hello, okay, uh, and testosterone levels bottoming out, I struggle to, ma to manage weight. Does menopause, okay, so menopause doesn't necessarily impact on how the body burns fat, okay? I think there are many, that's a multi-part question. The biggest change in your menopause is your, your bottom out, bottoming out of your estradiol and the androgenization, which means that you put fat, you, you tend to put fat in different reasons. So you change shape. So women are famously more pear-shaped, you know, so in other words, they, show, they store the fat around, around their bum, under the skin, uh, 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 subcutaneous, you can see the wobble factor. Whereas men, not exclusively, but men famously store more fat around their beer belly area, the, 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 the waist, okay? So you can see the different shapes, pear versus apple shaped. So what happens with set with a lot of women post-menopause is because of the change in ratio of testosterone to estradiol, to, to, to estrogen, you then begin to change where you put your, your, your fat as well. So in other words, you change shape more than anything. Now, there is obviously the, the sad uh, uh, state, the inexorable um, and progression of time, of father time, Okay, and what that what does happen is that we, as we get older, our basal metabolic rate, our rate of ability to burn fat, does begin to decrease. Why? A couple of reasons. Um, um, there are there are functional reasons. And the older you get, the more senior you get, the more likely you are to be sat on your bum do, doing work, so you move less. Um, but but and then you make more money, so you can afford uh, uh, better foods. And we don't eat less; we tend to eat more. Okay, uh, for that. But then there is also an, an inbuilt inefficiencies within us that means that our basal metabolic rate slowly dips. Okay, that 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 slope does differ depending on your genes, but the, the, the inexorably goes down. And so as a result, then you actually end up getting weight. So get, gaining weight. So a lot of people as they get older, because of their dropping basal metabolic rates include and and with changes in in, in their what they do in, in, in daily life, they do end up gaining weight automatically. Okay. Um, is there any link between genetics and appetite? Oh yes, yes, this is what we're talking about. So so the genetics 
of body weight, which is what we study by its very definition, okay, is the genetics of appetite, of appetite control. Now, appetite can be, appetite is a very, it's a feeding behavior. So appetite can be, I'm hungry. I'm hungry now, for example, I'm thinking about dinner, my tummy is, my t- tummy is grumbling. But appetitive behavior, what drives you towards food is not only hunger necessarily. It could be, well, I take longer to get full. Slightly different. Am I hungry or do I take more to be satiated? Okay. So it's it, there, there's slightly different biology there. Do I eat? Because this is my, my, my thing which I asked. Do you stress eat? Do, do, am I eating it because it makes me feel better? Okay. Or am I eating it because it tickles my reward centers? So the genetics covers all of these different genes, different path, uh, different pathways. But undoubtedly, there's going to be a genetics um, um, there. It's not all genetics, as I mentioned, but yes, genetics. Um, all right. So, ooh, thanks for the talk. How can we explain the difference in calorie absorption between two individuals eating the same food? Okay. Is it the microbiome explaining the difference? If so, how do genes impact it? This is another Cambridge typical multi-part question. So, okay, a cu- couple of things. Undoubtedly, okay, you, you'll notice when I say that the genetics of food and uh, the genetics of body weight is ineffective genetics of food intake and how our brain controls food intake, uh, how our brain controls our behavior. Why have I not talked about energy expenditure, about the ability to actually to actually um, burn? And and the reason is because of of is because it's actually difficult to measure energy expenditure. Energy expenditure, food is food, it's physical. What am I eating? There is a weight, you can see it. Energy expenditure, however, you you, me- you typically measure one of two things. You measure heat or you measure uh, a change in ratio of CO2 to O2 ratio, okay? Or you measure both. But you require specialized equipment, specialized rooms. It's difficult to accurately roll it out at the level you need to do genetics. So hundreds of thousands of people, that's just, not, we're not we're not there yet. So the first thing is it's easy to measure food intake, uh, um, and so therefore there's probably a measurement uh, um, error there. Secondly, um, it's always going to we we are designed to eat calories faster than we can burn it. What do I mean by this? Look, a Mars bar, other chocolate bars are available. Is what 240 calories roughly? If I'm motivated, and I often am, I can finish it in less than a minute. Okay, if if if, if even shorter, but it will always take me easily um, um, half an hour on a treadmill in order to in order to burn it off okay so in other words we are more efficient eating than it is to burn the numbers ne- never add up okay for, for, for that but yet those genes are going to be there it's just the effect sizes are going to be smaller and we haven't got a measurement that is effective enough to, 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 to actually do that now I've been just pinged that I can answer one more question and then I have to stop um, Thank you for the great talk. Are there effective ways of increasing your basal metabolic rate? All right. Do you know what? There are two different ways of increasing your metabolic rate. First is to get fatter. And people are thinking, what the hell is he talking about? The biggest influence on in your basal metabolic rate is your weight. People think, no, no. Okay, you look at something, look at that, look at the fat guy. He's slow, he's lumbering, he's not burning a lot of energy. Look at the skinny, wiry dude, he's running around. Okay. So you got to consider it kind of like a car. A Range Rover, big, is always going to have a higher fuel consumption than a Mini, okay? And that's true for human beings as well, okay? Now, that doesn't mean there are no changes in, in, uh, in, in, in rate, but, that's the, but that is the actual uh, uh, situation. The other way to do it is to exercise. Now, exercise will always put up your basal metabolic rate temporarily. And the more you exercise, the more you increase your basal metabolic rate and increase your muscle mass. And so I think that is it. I'm being told to stop, stop. I am now stopping. It's been a pleasure to speak to all of you. Thank you, Giles, for a highly engaging and entertaining presentation. Um, I think we've all learned an awful lot this evening, and I'm sure we'll take away some very practical ideas on eating um, to our day-to-day lives. So thank you very much. Um, If you'd like to find out more about our Stay Active Cambridge programme, which includes free exercise videos, the Coaches Corner and further live talks, then please do visit the University of Cambridge Sport website, the details of which will be on the screen shortly. Um, Thank you all for joining us. Thank you once again, Giles, and we hope to see you again soon. See you guys later. Bye bye.